I went to the front of the, the, the lobby to get a taxi and the taxi pulls up and I, I get in the taxi and um, the, the cab driver, his name was Barton, he goes, uh, hi my friend, my name's Barton, welcome to my beautiful country, Cape Town, South Africa, what brings you here? And I said, Barton, I'm here for business, but to be honest, I'm going to propose to love my life. Oh my God, love in Cape Town, this is such a beautiful thing, this is unbelievable. And he was so animated, I mean, it was hard to tell who was more excited, me or him, and we just fed off each other, this whole 15 minute cab ride. And we, it was just such a, you know, infectious energy. And I still remember the way the driver nodded at me as we made eye contact and he, and he drove up to pick me up. And uh, as, the, as the story has it, that, that driver was Burton. And uh, I remember we, we were driving uh, on, the, on route to the hotel and I asked him to stop at the, the store just so I can get uh, some, some, something to drink. And Bert invited Burton to come in with me and to, to get himself something to drink. Super small gesture, didn't really think anything of it. And uh, you would have thought I just handed him a thousand dollars. He was so appreciative. So we go out to dinner and we, you know, it was right in the marina on the water. There's a bunch of restaurants in Cape Town. And, and it's probably one in the morning, two in the morning. Yeah, And there's, in, in the marina by that restaurant, there's this big, you know, cul-de-sac with all the taxi cars lined up you can imagine there's probably 20 30 taxi cars and it's dark it's one in the morning and you know all of a sudden we kind of hear yelling in the distance yes and so i see like this beautiful black man like jumping and be like dah, dah. and i'm like is that like is someone like and I go, oh, shouting your Erica, name that's that's Barden. And you're like, yeah, I was like, who's Burton? And he's like, the guy that I told you, the guy, he, the guy from the taxi cab. And I remember all the way to the to the hotel, he's like, he was like, this is gonna be such an amazing trip for you. You will always remember. This year, it will change your life. He was and I'm so like, bubbly. Come on, Burton, you know, don't don't blow the surprise. <laughs> blow Come the on, surprise. But, but to be honest, we were so excited yeah, that night. Yeah, he was so cute. And Eric and I, we got in the hotel room, we looked at each other, and we're like. We're taking him everywhere. It was a couple of days before his birthday. Um, you know, I went to grab some lunch and found this farm to table restaurant. And I remember Burton was, you know, got the door for me and uh, was making his way back to the car to go sit down. And I said, Hey, wh where, are you, where are you going? Why don't you, uh, why don't you come join me? Uh, um, I, uh, I went to, you know, uh, use the restroom. And when I did so, I told the waitress. Uh, the gentleman who's dining with me, uh, his name is Burton. His birthday is in two days. Do you think we can, you know, surprise him with a with a birthday cake? And then my favorite part of, uh, I want to say that day, but really the favorite part of the the whole trip uh, happened a, a few moments later when I spotted the waitress uh, coming in behind Burton, and Burton obviously had no idea uh, that this was going to happen. Um, and uh, they has a surprise birthday song and birthday cake and. Uh, it was, uh, it was just such a such a nice day. And so the final day of the conference, there was this, uh, it was called the Bry on the Beach. The Bry in South Africa is a barbecue. And it was just amazing. It was on the beach and Erica came with me and Bairton was like waiting like in the distance in the cab. And and so it's finally, you know, I got my ring in, in the pocket, clenched in my hand and we go and uh, we get in the cab and I kind of like give a nod to Bairton. He goes, okay. You came to Cape Town to see beautiful views and, and, and beautiful views that we shall have on our way to Table Mountain. And we get there and there's a big sign that says closed due to high winds. And Baden absolutely saved the day. He put up his hand and he goes, you, you came to Cape Town for beautiful views and beautiful views you should have. He goes, Signal Hill it is. So we drive for about 15 minutes. We're winding, if you remember, in yeah. and out. And he pulls up in this little gravel parking lot and it, it, it was Signal Hill's a mountain. It's the mountain on the coast of South Africa. Beautiful. Beautiful. And I'm like, Baird, you did it. And I was like, game back on. So now I grab Erica. I'm, I'm holding her hand. And I got the ring in the other. And I just start walking. And you just like took the ring out, went on one knee, and I'm like, <gasps> I was completely shocked. It was so beautiful. And then when we were coming back, like on the way back, I remember, I mean, Burton was waiting for us. And he's leaning up against the car. And I remember I was like, 
Barton, I did it. She said yes. And his excitement. Oh, what did he, he got do? so excited. And then I look at Burton and he's tearing up. So, so anyways, you know, we're in the car and we, we took pictures with Barton. He's in our engagement photos. I yes. mean, he's more important in the story than Eric and I are. Honestly, that's how we feel. It was, yeah. it was just such a, there was such a deep connection, even though we knew him for just that short time. My parents had a safari trip to, to Africa scheduled. It was something they always wanted to do. It was a bucket list thing. And one of the touch points was Cape Town. I was like, Mom, you have to take Bear. You have to take him around town. He's going to be so excited. And my dad's like, well, you know, this trip, it's been planned, and they have cars to take you everywhere. I go, it doesn't matter. I don't care if you have private helicopters. You're canceling them. <laughs> You're taking Barton around. He's going to be excited to see you. And my mom's like, yeah, come on, skip. Barton, you know the story. All right, all right. So I said, when we get off the plane, how are we going to know who, we, who he is? So when we got, got off the plane and we were walking, I could see him with a big sign. And I just, I knew it was him by his big, beautiful smile. And I, when, when he gave me such a warm hug, I he felt like family right away. And he says, I've been counting down the months. I've been counting down the weeks. I've been counting down the days. And he said, I've been here for three hours, so I wouldn't miss you. And that was love in person. When they came back, it was an amazing trip. And they said of all the incredible things we did and the, seeing the lines and the dress, you want to know what my favorite part was? She goes, my favorite part was spending time with Barrett. What an incredible man that is. And she's like, I get it. I get why you love that story so much. We, we got to talking and, you know, I got, got a little insight into his life and um, you know, the, the really long hours that he works uh, to support and provide for his family. And um, I was just really uh, genuinely in awe, um, you know, how much this father uh, did for his family. And I, I came from a situation where my, my father actually left us when I was uh, seven years old. And, um, you know, growing up with that, I, I just, uh, I don't know, I just really genuinely moved by um, you know, how much he did and how much he cared for his family and the sacrifices he would make to put food on the table and roof over their head. And, um, I just felt, I just felt compelled to you know, get to know this guy and, uh, and, and just, he's just the, the kindest man. And, and now how quickly I was able to figure that out goes to show just the, just the, the, the magnetic force around Burton and, and, and the good that just emanates from him. When the war started in 1998, back in Congo DRC in Bukavu, we was preparing to get married. We just get married, and then after a few days, Betten left. I had to leave the, I had to leave the city because they were already planning to close the borders. And this, since I didn't have enough money to come the same time, me and my wife, I had to leave her behind. Once I go to South Africa, my first mission was to try to get a job so that I can be able to to bring down my wife and my son. We left the DRC in January 2001. Wasn't get a packer bag and go to the airport. It was a lot more extreme than that. We traveled to, to Rwanda and then went to Tanzania. And from Tanzania, we, we went to to Zambia and then Zambia, Namibia, and from Namibia to come to South Africa. Throughout all of that, they, we used different modes of transport. So it would have been cars, it would have been um, buses, it was canoes. We didn't have proper documents to, to go to Namibia. We took a canoe with a fisherman to help us to cross through the night with a canoe. And then the person who helped us to cross, he was eaten by the crocodile. After we crossed, it was by the shore side. It was eaten by the crocodile. Once we had arrived in Namibia, it was about February, I think, if I'm not mistaken. And we were actually in prison because obviously we were illegal immigrants, so we were traveling with no documents. We were locked up for like about over, just over a month, and then we were released into a refugee camp. 
and we spent three months in the refugee camp, myself and my mom. Once we finally were finally able to leave the refugee camp, that's when we finally made it to, to Cape Town and reunited with my dad. When Bridget and Hope Cho reached here, when I met them, when they arrived in South Africa, oh, the feeling, the emotion, the joy was unbelievable. When I was working in the rain, in the sun, in the hot, in the wind, in my mind, I was just seeing those two people. Every minute, seeing them in my mind. The reason why I look up to my dad is because of everything I picked up, as in, in terms of his, his work rate, his ethic, you know, his, his, the values that he installed into me. He was all about grinding every single day. Like, he never had a holiday in his life. Like, this um, pandemic is actually the first break he's ever had from working since 2000. This is the first break he's ever had. When I look back at it, it's quite, it was quite inspiring for me because he, like I said, he'd stand in this dry, hot sun for hours from 8 in the morning until 5 in the afternoon and then going into the evening. That was like a repetitive thing and the same for winter where it's rainy, it's wet, it's cold. It's all he's ever done. Yeah, so that's how I went as a cagat for those 13 good years. Yes, I enjoyed the job even though it was not easy, but I enjoyed it because from the same job, I managed to bring my wife and my son. I managed to pay my rent every month and to put food on the table, which was the main thing. So I was able to support my family. Even when he got a new job, it was all, it's, it's him leaving. He'd leave, he'd come home at like 2, in, 2 a.m. in the night, and then I'll be awake sometimes, and he told me, oh no, he has a trip at like 4 a.m., so he set, sets like 10 alarms and be like, oh no, I have to leave in two hours to go to the airport. It's always been a situation where it's, it, it, work comes first in terms of him providing for us, so no matter what, he's always taken that upon himself, and if he didn't have the faith and believe that things were going to get better, we wouldn't be where we are. We wouldn't be able to like, you know, look back and, and smile and be grateful for everything. And because when you come from nothing, it's, it's uh, to look back at, at, you know, coming from scratch and, you know, having something that you can call your own, something that, something that you can own and, and be proud of, it's, it's, a, it's a big thing. So, you know, we always thank God for that. I mean, he, he always reminds me that it's only by God's grace that we were able to get to where we were able to end. No matter what, he will always provide for us, no matter what the situation might be. Fast forward to May of 2018, and he sent me a message, and um, he said, My friend, is it possible if you can try to check around if, if you can be able to, to find like a sponsor or a scholarship for my son? so he can, he can go and study that side. And I said, of course, let me learn more about it and see if I can help. What I really meant to say is, I graduated about 20 years ago and my son's two and I'm already starting to save for his college over the next 17 years. I had a little idea of what to do and how to figure it out, but like anything with Burton, you just feel compelled uh, to try to help and give back if, if, however you can. So as luck would have it, a month later, I was in St. Louis for work. And um, at the end of my trip, we we're, were heading back to the airport. Uh, as I was riding in that taxi, the, the driver was a, was a young man. And uh, I, I was speaking with him about, you know, what it was, how do you like St. Louis? How long has he been living there? Um, you know, asking him more about you know his experiences, and it turns out he was an international student as well um, from uh, from Eastern Europe, and he told me about the College of Saint Rose, and he said they had a very good international program there. Um, he had a contact there within the international department who could help work with me and navigate it and figure out if there is any options uh, for uh, for for Burton's son Hopejoy. And then Amir got back to me, where he, he texted me, he sent me a link to, to the College of St. Rose where, where it said um, there was scholarships available. And so I looked into it and I thought, okay, you know, it's a top. let me just, you know, fill in the application, whatever happens, happens. And then they got back to me where they, they, they wanted like 
they got back to me and they said, um, tell us more about yourself. And they wanted like a, a motivational letter to say why they should accept me and all those things. And I thought, okay, this is getting serious. And me, as I took a step back and I did my, I did an essay and stuff like that. And, and they got back to me after they had read my motivation letter. And they said, okay, you accepted. I was like, you know, yeah, you, they said, yeah, you've been granted a scholarship to come study at the College of St. Rose. But then when they said I got a scholarship, I, th I immediately thought, okay, I got, it's like, I'm, I'm done, I'm through, right? But then I, I read further and I was like, okay, the scholarship only covers a certain amount of money. And then I saw the, the, the balance. We were so excited, yes, when we were told that Hope Tree had been accepted at the college. By the time now, we were told that there is a balance of 23,000 per year. Oh my God. Yeah, so I told him, and then he mentioned, he suggested that I look into like student loans. And then the problem with that was in South Africa, we, since we're not citizens, we, we aren't able to, to, to apply for loans in South Africa. So that was really out of the question. And then Amir was willing to take out a loan on, to co-sign a loan on his name here in the United States. But then still a lot to ask for because the interest rates over, over a long time, it's not fair to like, you know, put my, my dad under that pressure. We tried out other avenues and then I found out of this, this app called Scully. I looked at that app and I looked for, for scholarships from there, for the scholarships. And then most of the scholarships said it's, it's only for, for US citizens. But then there was a, there was a point where, I don't know if it's, it was my, a little bit of my, my parents having faith and be like, you know what, just, just do it, just go, just, you know, you've been accepted, they've given you a scholarship. I mean, the money is just, it's, just, it's a small hassle, it's a small issue for them. So one way or another, we'll, we'll get through it, right? We'll, we'll overcome it. We thought, okay, let me get my documents together. 2019, so we started like, you know, getting my passport together and applying for visas and stuff like that. And, and now we had to play now because they gave him three chances. We had to, to postpone first because he's supposed to register. The first chance he could register the passport was not there. The second one as well, I think we got the passport a bit late in the time to, to get the document and so on. So that was the last one. If he couldn't make it on that one, then he could have lost his scholarship. Now we're in November of 2019. Hope Joy is slotted to start in January of 2020. Unfortunately, the, the visa interview and all, all that paperwork just wasn't done in time to, to start in the fall. And um, it was around my, my own birthday, and I, I started to uh, raise money through, through Facebook. And uh, you know, luckily, we were able to raise about half the amount that was needed uh, for the uh, Hope Joy's flight um, to, the, to the United States to, to begin the studies. And then, next thing we know, he sends me a link to, to my ticket, to my flight ticket. We were in awe, we didn't believe like, this is how it was like, turning out. Like, First, we didn't know I was gonna go. Now I have a plane ticket. Now I'm booked to leave. We were, we at the airport. My family, everyone's we all together. Like everyone, all my loved ones, everyone that I've known for all that's grown up with me, alongside me for all the the past ten years, basically. They're all there to support me and wish me well, right? And at that moment, I was just I was just grateful for the for that moment to be in that moment, right? I was just like, you know what? I'm just going to to ride this wave, whatever whatever happens, happens. But you know, his, his first week in Boston wasn't uh, all fun and games, it was also a, a certain amount of reality that, that did kick in. It just seemed like uh, an insurmountable amount to pay. And I was intending on, on getting the, the loans on, on his behalf, but it was, um, it was gonna be over $100,000 of debt for me to take. And, as much as I wanted to, it just wasn't something that would be uh, fair, um, I think, for my own family uh, to do that. I wish I, I wish I had the, the means to just write that check, but I don't. And uh, it really, I struggled with having the stuff I, I, I wanted to do and how I wanted to provide um, and, and make this happen for Hope Joy. And then we, we said, okay, let's just go to, 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 to Albany. So I'm up to Albany, we speak to, to Dr. Varela, tell him the situation that we're in. He said one more thing, he, the last resort he told us was speak to the, to the, to the bursar, right? Go speak to 
the, the head of financial aid. We spoke to him and he told us, okay, yeah, he might be able to, to get some further funds. So that was January, the first, that was January. And by then I would always go into his office every week because he told us sometimes the donors, there will be some, some I don't know, significant you know, increase in my scholarship. It went into February where we, we still didn't know. And then finally we got an answer where he trimmed it down a bit, but still I was like, no, this is, you know, this is the, the end of the road. I just, I knew Hope Joy deserved this opportunity. I was stuck. I was pretty upset. I was depressed. I was stressed out because I couldn't complete this journey. I phoned my dad, right? And I told him, this is the amount that's being taken out and this is the amount that's going to be owed. But for some reason he had like optimism. I don't know why, but he was like, no, don't worry about it. We'll make a way. We'll make a way for you. Like, and then on March 1st of 2020, um, everything changed. I got a text from this guy I've never met, uh, this guy named Tim Powell from Houston, Texas, who said he's a friend of Burton's. He heard about our story and he's here to help. He sent me a message said, my friend, um, I have a serious matter to discuss with you. Can we jump on a call soon? So he, we call, it was a Saturday morning. So I said, what's going on? Um, he's like, well, my son, Hope Joy, he's been accepted to a college, a university in the United States. Can you believe it? And he's got a scholarship. And I'm like, wow, you know, that's unbelievable. He's like, oh, so? I go, <laughs> what, what's going on? This is great news. It, it sounded, you said you had a serious matter to, to discuss. He said, yeah, he goes, the scholarship's 50% and the tuition's $46,000 a year. So we owe $23,000 for the year. It comes out just over 12,000 per semester. And, and he, he takes a pause and he said, he said, my friend, I, I don't, I don't feel comfortable asking this burden of you, but you're my last chance. He said, we've tried everything. We've looked at loans. We've looked at additional scholarships. And we just have no other avenue here. And I woke up this morning and God said, call Tim Powell. He can help. And in that moment, I mean, I would have written a check there if I could. We didn't have the money. And I said, Baron, we're going to help. You know, we're going to help. And honestly, you know, I thought we were going to donate a little money. And I just said, he's in Cape Town. He probably doesn't realize there's scholarships out there. There's, there's resources for this stuff. And I said, okay, when does he start school? And he goes, he's at school already. I go, oh. And he goes, and we need the money in three weeks. Or else they're, gonna, they're not going to let him register for the fall. He's probably going to lose a student visa. And he's probably going to have to come back home. And so the serious meter got dialed up a bit in that moment. And I said, well, you know, scholarships, that's not possible. We don't have time. You know, I talked to Erica and I just said, we have to, we have to privately raise this money. We'll set up a GoFundMe. And then I, I got all these documents and I read his college letter. And I learned of the story of his family fleeing yeah. from the DRC and the hardships. And, and I said, and I was crying. And I said, Eric, you got to read this. I was like, this is no longer us maybe helping, this is happening. Like, yeah. if we have to take a loan out, if whatever we gotta do, we will pay this if we can't raise the money, but this is a must. And she read it and she looked at me and she said, 100%, like, this kid deserves this too much, we can't let him down. And so that embarked probably one of the most amazing weeks of our lives. Uh, we reached out to friends and to family and we told the story, and the amount of support and love that we received was overwhelming. I mean, we raised sixteen thousand dollars in in six days or seven days. I mean, it was it was amazing. It was amazing. Very quickly, we just had this momentum, and we said, "This is not a, a one semester deal. This is all four years. Like, we, we're not going to lean on scholarships. We're going to stop gonna, here. Yeah. We're going to do this ourselves. Like, this is this is too good a story. He deserves it too much. You know. So you fast forward." Uh, He's finished his first semester. And, you know, one of the questions is, through all of this, he's still a kid. He's, yeah. he's still moving from South Africa to the U.S. COVID-19 is happening. The school was shut down. He was by himself for a few months. You know, how's he going to do academically? How's he going to handle all this? And he did amazingly. He, he had almost a 3.6 GPA. Perseverance, hard work, and just faith and belief that 
you know, God has a plan for you. There's so much pride that that will come along with it, you know. I could, I could give, I could give to my parents to be like, look, you carried me through this. At the end of the day, this is this is what we were able to accomplish, and I just want to show that there's, there's literally nothing that's impossible. Like literally, nothing is impossible. Yeah, and I feel like we all in our lives we have had a, a time where we all needed a chance. We all needed a chance, just someone that it was gonna open a door for you. Just take that chance. And I think this is it for him. This is his chance. If we can get Hope Joy a degree here in the United States and what he can do for his family, um, his, his father who works in 17 hour days, seven days a week, backbreaking work, uh, with no end in sight, you know, he's going to be able to, Hope Joy is going to be able to take care of his family. The, the secret to living is giving. Yes. And it's, it's the most fulfilling thing you can have. And, and when, when you give and you help incredible people, you know, the, the story is not going to stop here. Uh, this is only the beginning. And he's going to do amazing things. But I'm so grateful and thankful for everyone who has been supporting my son and my family. I'm grateful for that opportunity that he's given my son, for everyone who have contributed. We are so grateful as a family. We are so grateful and thankful. May God bless you all.